My thesis is A Constant Crisis, A History and Review of American Inpatient Psychiatry. And so why this topic? I want to eventually be a psychiatrist, and so doing this would allow me to develop a greater context of today's healthcare infrastructure. I've also worked in a group home for developmentally disabled adults for two years in a structure I've seen as highly effective, and this can be contrasted with my current job in a hospital where I've seen a buildup of patients who no longer necessarily need medical services but have nowhere else to go. And then finally, the insane asylum era of healthcare has always been fascinating to me, and I wondered how true the portrayal of this era actually is. So in this thesis, I hope to evaluate the effectiveness of inpatient American psychiatry throughout American history. In doing so, I aim to find trends in what makes some treatments more effective than others, which will inform potential solutions for a system that is plagued by demand, yet is restricted by its supply of care providers. This will be done via multi-method approach, including library, archival, and survey research. So a timeline of American mental health approaches. So in the first couple bubbles here before 1793, care is largely custodial, although hospitals are beginning to pop up. And then 1793 to 1870, we see humane moral treatment beginning to pop up, um, although it doesn't get to America until about 1840. And then from 1880 to about 1963, there's varying levels of care, although it is largely custodial for the most chronic patients. And then finally, deinstitutionalization is accomplished by the 1963 CMHC law, which really all it does is create the return of the decentralized approach. So before the asylum, um, mental health care was informed by English poor laws passed in the 16th century, which leads to the development of the almshouse for the poor and disabled and the workhouse for criminals. Treatment was custodial both inside and outside of these settings, although in 1752 there's the creation of the first American hospital, which is later run by Benjamin Rush, the forefather of American psychiatry, who begins implementing rudimentary medical solutions such as bloodletting and the tranquilizer chair at right. <clears throat> in the 1790s, European mental health infrastructure is far more advanced, yet is still plagued with cases of patient abuse. And so in 1793, Philippe Pinel develops moral treatment, which is this idea that you can cure individuals of their mental illness through character development and talking to them in a humane way. This is brought to England in 1796 with the Tuke family, and then Dorothea Dix brings us back to America in the 1830s after visiting uh, the Tuke family's York retreat in England and contrasting that to the current mental health system in America. So between 1840 and 1870, um, we see a lot of these state hospitals popping up. The aim was to eliminate the decentralized approach of prior by treating the mental illness in a facility with similar individuals. Most of these were built under the Kirkbride plan, and so these facilities were meant to be built in rural areas away from the chaos of urban life and have long rambling wings where you could easily section off patients based off of illness, and there was never meant to have more than 250 individuals in these facilities. It was meant to treat the curable insane. It wasn't really ever meant to be a facility for the chronically ill, although it was thought the chronically ill could be cured originally. And there's also no way to prevent wrongful admissions. So we see this is a tool of oppression against dissenting women in the mid-19th century. In evaluating early asylum treatments between 1840 and 1890, the percentage of mentally ill in state hospital rises from about 30 to about 70%. Simultaneously, the almshouse population is declining, which is at large responsible for some of the increase here and schizophrenia is the most common diagnosis also the longest stays so moral treatment is not really effective for people who have schizophrenia as it requires more medical inter interventions which were not developed at the time although dipsomania there on the low graph is a fancy term for um <coughs> 19th century alcoholism and as you can see, this was relatively effective um, in the, the insane asylum. Although by the 1890s, there's a buildup of chronic patients, and so these facilities are now housing over 500, over 1,000, and sometimes even over 2,500 people in some cases. And so there's a focus on preventing more people from entering the system rather than trying to lower the amount present. In the 1930s, there's a resurgence in optimism in treating these patients as medical science advances. So surgical bacteriology sort of predates this a little bit, um, but the idea was that you could remove the infected teeth of mentally ill individuals and would cure them of their illness, which is not true. Malaria therapy was a cure for neurosyphilis, which was a big issue at the time. Um, it was the end stage of a sexually transmitted disease that presented with a lot of psychiatric symptoms.
Insulin and metrazole therapy were supposed to be therapies for the chronically ill, particularly the schizophrenic. Insulin therapy, you would give the patient a lot of sugar and then they would go into a coma, which you could then reverse with insulin. And metrazole therapy induced convulsions, which would somehow lead to the patient being more calm after the fact. And then lobotomies, you're removing a part of the brain to reduce violent behavior, which is, of course, barbaric, although it did improve the condition of about 33% of people, although 33% had really adverse effects. And all of these treatments were really done without considerable oversight to consider how these may negatively impact the patients. <coughs> so after World War II, anti-psychiatric sentiment really begins to grow even more in popular culture. Um, Albert Deutsch, The Shame of the States, really portrays the negative side of the asylum, including an incontinence ward where it's a picture of 300 naked men in a dark basement. Uh, PTSD is also on the rise after World War II, although people don't really understand what this is just yet. And so in the 1950s, President Eisenhower uh, appoints a joint commission to investigate the state hospital system, which later recommends the federal government take a greater role in health care. In 1963, um, JFK passes the CMHC Act, which provides federal funding for local communities and outpatient clinics so patients can theoretically live in the community, although only half of these facilities are really ever built. And so the effects of this, um, from 1955 to 75, the asylum population is, is reduced by two-thirds, while the general population nearly doubles. Although a general lack of oversight leads to local communities having too much freedom, and they create facilities that don't necessarily treat the chronically ill. And so a variety of private businesses take hold to really fill the need, and we see just really this just amalgam of different approaches to mental health care. Some lessons from the past, America has a legacy of providing varying levels of custodial care for the mentally ill. However, dignity and independence must be emphasized even if these individuals are incurable. A lack of oversight has led to notorious abuse of patient rights in the past, and although mental health has historically been a local and state issue, there are examples of the federal government taking responsibility. <clears throat> and then this is really just a diagram of what I explained two slides ago, where before 1963, there were really just these state asylums, and then now there's just a, a wide variety of different approaches. And so to look at a few of these, first, long-term care facilities. This can be divided into really two different types of facilities. So nursing homes provide regular medical services, while residential care facilities do not. Although in residential care facilities, the individuals are there because they cannot live on their own. And so in theory, it provides med better medical care than is possible at home. Group homes especially emphasize community building and patient abuse appears to be on the decline. However, there's a lack of oversight at both the state level and at the federal level, there's often quality control issues found. There's low staffing ratios. The quality life of patients is not really assessed and it is difficult to do so in some cases. And the availability of, the, the availability of beds continues to decline. Rehabilitation centers and 90-day programs is a relatively low rate of relapse, and the highly structured treatment environment is very reminiscent of moral treatment, which tends to be really effective on these types of people. And then the bad, uh, Medicare language does not pay for licensed counseling, so only 42% of facilities can actually accept Medicare. Um, Medicare really only covers the, the stay of being in the facility. And then only 70% can actually accept Medicaid. And then there's a lack of supports for the elderly, a population where um, <clears throat> substance use is increasing. And then prisons, the good, the amount of mentally ill and developmentally disabled that are mistreated appears to be on the decline. Although the bad, America has about seven times the amount of prisoners per capita as other developed countries where the mentally ill are overrepresented and there's an incredible lack of mental health infrastructure. And there are a gr there's a greater abuse of patient rights in private prisons, despite them supposedly not taking chronically mentally ill offenders. And then two thirds of prisoners will return to the justice system. Potential solutions, increase federal funding and state oversight for long-term care facilities. Update Medicare language so it is more inclusive for rehab centers and require mental health care provisions in taxpayer-funded prisons. And then finally, higher wages for service providers to combat low staffing. And then further research, I want to investigate the comorbidity of mental illness in the chronically homeless. To what degree hospitals must act as long-term care facilities when they're not supposed to and how this impacts overall patient care in a broad sense. And then I want to gather survey data from both service providers and individuals in the general population to see where the public discourse is on this issue. 
And then that is it for my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Any questions?